Um, so welcome everyone uh, to this lecture on the Notre Dame de Paris, uh, the most famous building in France. And really, there is no building in the United States that mm -hmm. sums up our national identity, not even the Capitol or the White House, the way that Notre Dame, our Lady of Paris, has stood for both the city of Paris and really the country of France for nearly a millennium now. It is that central a building in French culture. Uh, it sits on the Ile de la Cité in the center of the Seine, uh, that river which is the lifeblood of France. Uh, and if we look at an... Um, an old map from 1607, we can see that the map maker has placed uh, the Ile de la Cité and Notre Dame right in the center of his image of Paris. Uh, so the left bank on one side, the right bank on the other, Notre Dame at the heart of the Ile de la Cité at the heart of France. Uh, originally, Notre Dame, the spiritual side, uh, and the royal palace on the rest of the Ile de la Cité, um, taking care of the worldly aspect of um, ruling over this city. Uh, and Notre Dame is literally the starting point of all roads in France. Since 1924, this little oh. um, marker in the pavement outside of Notre Dame has been the, um, the starting point, the mile zero for the entire French road system. Uh, so we can see this little um, bit. Um, so this, this is where it all begins, Notre Dame, uh, Our Lady. Um, and there were rumors, traditions, uh, that the original Notre Dame, built in the fifth century of the Common Era, was built atop a Roman temple to Jupiter. Now, that was substantiated in 1710 when this uh, block that seems to be an altar to Jupiter was uncovered uh, during restoration work that was being done on the crypt of Notre Dame. So underneath the great cathedral, they found this. But not only does it have familiar Roman gods, Vulcan and Jove or Jupiter, but it also has, you know, it, vestiges of an even earlier religion, uh, because there are also Gaulish gods represented on this block, like Asus, um, uh, Evrises, and so forth. Uh, so there was a very long spiritual tradition of worship on the Ile de la Cité, on the east end of the Ile de la Cité. Uh, and Notre Dame itself replaced five earlier churches you know, that, that each replaced the next successively. That, that very tiny early church um, was succeeded by another church, which was succeeded by a somewhat larger church that was built, burned down in the ninth century by the Vikings. Um, but ultimately, the present church replaced two churches, one called Our Lady, and another dedicated to Saint Etienne, uh, or Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Uh, and uh, Notre Dame was built in the 13th century, which um, means that it was a new style of architecture, but it still owed something to the impetus of the Romanesque style uh, that really uh, led to a wave of church building in Europe um, 
in the era after the year 1000. There was such a strong belief in the medieval imagination that the apocalypse would happen in the year 1000 that nobody wanted to start building a church in the year 987 because it wasn't going to be finished in time. The world was going to end in just a few years. But when that didn't come to pass, well, they thought they had, well, at least another 500 years. So um, this wave of church building occurred throughout Europe in what we call the Romanesque or Roman-like style. So this is just one such Romanesque church, Saint Cernan in uh, Toulouse. And you can see that it is a, well, you can't see, it's the photograph doesn't give you a sense of how dark and heavy this building actually is. The masonry walls are enormous, sometimes you know, a dozen feet thick. Uh, these are stone churches, the better to survive fire, um, with barrel vaulted ceilings. Um, and that meant that the the nave could not be terribly wide because your vault couldn't be you know, terribly uh, expansive uh, in order for it to hold up. Um, however, Notre Dame was built after a church just six miles away uh, created a revolution in architecture by combining um, two previous kinds of architecture. Uh, so this is a um, this is the Church of Saint Etienne in Caen, uh, in Normandy, where we see ribbed vaulting. Uh, these are still round arches, barrel vaults, but you can see this stonework um, of ribbing that X's across the vaults that makes them much stronger. Well, uh, the architect, um, that we'll be talking about that we don't know exactly his name um, at Saint Denis, the Abbey Church of Saint Denis, combined those ribbed vault, um, ribbed arches from Normandy, with the pointed arches of Burgundy. And it's worth pointing out that when Notre Dame was erected in the 13th century, the kings of France ruled just the heartland around Paris. They were surrounded by much more powerful dukedoms. The Dukes of Normandy and the Dukes of Brittany were much wealthier and more powerful. Uh, so in Paris, in the early 13th century, these pointed arches from Burgundy were combined with these ribbed um, round vaults from Normandy to create the Gothic style. It wasn't yet called that. In fact, the word Gothic was initially an insult. But in Saint-Denis, uh, the, around the year 1140, so the, the 12th century, under the auspices of Abbot Suget, uh, this unknown architect created ribbed pointed vaults. So you can see them here. Um, and you can see the ribbing, but you can also see that these are pointed arches. So they are held up by these slender columns, because by combining the pointed arch with the ribbing, you created this strength in the vaulting that meant that you could have um, these veils of much less stone. You could go higher and higher. Uh, you could build lighter and lighter. Uh, it allowed lots of space for windows. And Abbot Suget felt that an important church, an abbey church or a cathedral, should simulate the um, the city of heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem, as described in the book of Revelation, uh, with its um, precious metals and precious stones, rubies and emeralds, he would simulate that with stained glass. And this new style with 
you know, it, instead of the, those very heavy churches with almost no windows, um, this new style allowed for higher, lighter churches with lots and lots of windows uh, because all the weight is coming down on these columns, these piers. Uh, so this happened in Paris um, roughly um, oh, 60 years or so before the beginning, the gestation of um, Notre Dame. And Saint-Denis also had um, flying buttresses. There is, in fact, a lot of scholarly debate over whether the first flying buttresses are here at Saint-Denis or whether these were added later after they were pioneered at Notre Dame. Uh, we're unlikely to be able to answer that question. Both, um, both buildings bear flying buttresses to hold up these light structures, to keep them as, um, to keep the walls as glass as much glass as possible, uh, as transparent, as beautiful as possible. Uh, so this is the floor plan of Saint-Denis from about 1150. Uh, and you can see that it's basic shape. Here's where you enter. Up here is the altar, the apse uh, or choir, uh, the place reserved to the clergy. And you can see that the basic floor plan is that of a Latin cross um, with an upright and a, uh, a crossing, which we call a transept. Uh, and it, there are three um, basic parts here, the nave, that big central aisle, and a side aisle on either side. But then once you get up to the choir, um, to give space to pilgrims who want to visit this building and pay their respects to uh, relics that would be stored in each of these um, chapels radiating uh, off the back of the altar area. Well, there is a second aisle, what we call an ambulatory or a walking path that goes around the choir. So you don't disturb the monks at prayer and you can pay your respects uh, to all of these chapels. You know, you can start here and work your way around. Pilgrimage was big business in the, um, in the Middle Ages. Uh, so that's 11, the, the 1140s. Uh, in the 1160s, the kings of France decided that they needed to knock down those two smaller churches on the Ile de la Cité and begin to erect a cathedral in this brand spanking new style uh, that was pioneered just six miles away at Saint-Denis. Uh, so you can see here too, uh, the, um, the flying buttresses, uh, actually the original flying buttresses are up here. We'll see that later. They were replaced uh, in the 14th century by these much more space age looking ones uh, around the apps. Um, but this would become the, uh, at the time, the highest and um, one of the largest churches in Christendom. So I promise this is the last floor plan I will show you, uh, but I just wanted to show you uh, a comparison between the, the Basilica plan of Saint-Denis, which is not a cathedral, a cathedral is the seat of a bishop, um, and the plan of Notre Dame as it now stands, not to scale, Notre Dame is bigger, uh, but you'll note that Notre Dame is much wider than Saint-Denis. It has um, that central nave, but it has two side aisles and the transept or crossing barely projects beyond the outline of the church. It was not originally that way. Um, later in its construction, it was decided that they needed more chapel space, again, um, for pilgrims to come uh, to pay devotions, uh, space to hold relics, and so forth. And so originally, 
the walls ended here and the transept was bumped out, uh, but the architects um, in the um, late uh, 14th century tore away those walls in between their piers and bumped out chapels um, to create this, you know, um, almost rainbow shaped building uh, where you can barely see the trans transept projecting at all. Um, so it was it was always in flux, this building. Um, it was always changing and growing. Uh, and we know something about medieval building techniques largely through medieval manuscript uh, illumination. Where a favorite subject is the building of the Tower of Babel. But if we see, um, if we look at this, we see this 15th century miniature that is showing us essentially some of the, the kinds of machines gadgets that medieval architects, masons had to get enormous blocks up the building. Uh, so here is a wheel. Uh, this is essentially a kind of a crane. Uh, there is rope up over that uh, thing up there and they are hauling uh, you know, these two men are turning that wheel to haul these slabs up higher into the building. Uh, and then more cranes would be added higher up as well. So you can see there's another one up here. Uh, there are more structures up here. Um, here we can see a larger wheel uh, in this illustration of the building of the Temple of Jerusalem. Uh, I'm going to zoom in so we can look at this, um, this crane up here. This is a walking wheel. So if you've ever been to the Pacific Science Center uh, to their courtyard where there is a, wee, a water wheel that people can get inside and walk uh, the wheel around, this worked exactly that way, uh, where workmen would spend all day or whenever things needed to come up or down, walking in that wheel, step by step, the wheel would turn, uh, the various gears would turn, and blocks would be lifted up to the, um, the parapet here, which looks very much like a Gothic building. You can see in the foreground carving of the kinds of moldings and sculptures that decorate Notre Dame itself um, is going on. Uh, so we see some of these, uh, these workmen uh, hard at work. Uh, and we know from tax records that some of the people that built these great buildings were women. Uh, usually they were part of artisan families. Um, but here we see them, uh, you know, carrying materials. They were probably more likely to be spreading mortar, uh, which is what this woman is hauling, than to be hewing the really huge blocks. Um, but a cathedral was an enormous construction site and an enormous public works project uh, that employed hundreds of people, uh, you know, from the very um, humblest trades to the most skilled. Uh, for instance, someone had to erect all of this scaffolding um, to make the ladders um, and so forth. So uh, they employed a lot of people creating these buildings. Uh, so we're going to go inside. Um, Notre Dame was started at the east end the apse, the altar end. Now, if you were building a cathedral, that was the preferable place to start because if you got the altar built, you could consecrate it and start using the building and then just build the rest of it um, as time went on. And the kings of France who were so eager to establish their legitimacy in these days liked to have important personages at layings of foundation stones and at the, you know, saying the first mass, consecrating the building. So the Pope, 
was there from Rome um, when the foundation stones were laid in about 1160. Um, the um, Patriarch of Constantinople said the first mass in this building just 22 years later in 1182. Um, of course, it was just this end of the building. And we used to think that a cathedral like this would be built absolutely logically, starting at the altar and moving bay by bay uh, to the west end, and then the facade would go up and then the roof would go over it. Um, and um, then the, you know, the carved decoration would go up. But archaeologists now feel that it was more piecemeal than that, um, that, you know, some bits and pieces were done out there and then in here, um, and that a lot of it had to do with the most efficient uses of the scaffolding, um, because they didn't have enough scaffolding to just um, ring the entire building. They had to uh, be very mindful about not moving it here and then back there and then back up, uh, but doing it in a, uh, a way that made sense at the time. Uh, you also couldn't do a lot of the work in the winter. Uh, and so a lot of these elements would be carved in the Mason's Lodge in the winter and then set in place um, during the more um, uh, clement months of the year. Uh, and so uh, there's a real standardization of the kinds of blocks. There's, the, you know, this block here is identical to that block there um, so that they, they can be um, crafted and set into place. They don't have to be carved in place. Uh, so they, they started here, where the rhythm of this building is um, quickened as it reaches the altar. So the, um, the arches, the pointed arches, get closer together as they come together at the end of the building. Uh, the bays are narrower. Um, and each, because this is early Gothic, each of these uh, bays rests upon a column. So you can see these, um, these columns uh, that are enormous drums set of stone, set one atop the next. Uh, I think you can maybe see the lines. Um, and originally, they would have been brilliantly painted. Um, if we can't see them here, we'll see them in another uh, image. Uh, but this is the earliest part of the cathedral. Here we go. You can see these enormous um, uh, circles of stone that are stacked one atop the next, uh, leading up to what emulates a classical Corinthian um, capital. And yet, unlike a classical Corinthian capital, these are all unique. Each one of these is different from the next and the next. Uh, so we can see, uh, again, this is the, um, well, the choir starts right there. Um, uh, so this is the nave, but uh, we can see that the bottom layer is what we call the arcade layer. It tends to be the darkest because the windows are on the far side of those you know, two side aisles uh, and then the chapels. Uh, but you can see those pointed arches, those ribbed vaults that allowed these architects to go vertical. Uh, the next story up is called the Triforium or thrice pierced um, because of these um, tiny arcades that create three little arches. And the number three is very significant within Christianity. So uh, it represents the Holy Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The church itself is you know, is tripartite, as we'll see when we look at the facade. Um, so that the bottom is the arcade layer, then we have the triforium, except that it's just a biforium in the choir in this earliest part, uh, because they are closer together, that, that rhythm quickens. Um, and then the 
uppermost level we call the clear story. And that is the level that is entirely stained glass. So in this um, triforium level, there is a gallery. Uh, there is more seating. Uh, you can pack more and more uh, of the faithful into this building on holy days. But at that top layer, it is just gorgeous colored stained glass. And this must have seemed an absolute miracle to the medieval people who came inside this building and looked up and, and it's soaring, it's light piercing in through colored glass. Um, it must have looked just unbelievably um, magnificent and transcendent. Uh, so here's a detail of the choir. Um, we can, uh, when we photograph um, windows, uh, sometimes we lose the colors uh, and uh, you can kind of see that that's stained glass. Um, and this, almost all of this is 19th century stained glass. Um, but you, you get this sense of this, this, oops, what did I do? Um, this gorgeous logical structure. Um, and on the outside, we have these flying buttresses holding it up. Now, when I was in college, I learned that the flying buttress was invented just in the nick of time, that the architects of Notre Dame, and we don't know the names of any of the first five or so architects, these master builders, but that they were too ambitious and they put up walls that were too high for the technology that they had. But uh, over at Saint-Denis, they invented the flying buttress and they came and applied them here. And lo and behold, the walls stood up. We now think that the uh, flying buttresses were always integral uh, to the construction of Notre Dame. Um, as I mentioned, these are the newer ones. These are the original ones. And the original ones were much bulkier. They required a lot more stone, hundreds of thousands of tons of stone. Um, and this is a um, cross section of one of these original buttresses. Um, so this is, these are the two side aisles. So this is the, the wall, this is the gallery level, and this is the clear story level uh, with the window. And this is the vault of the uh, ceiling, not the roof, but the ceiling. And all of this extra arching and vault work um, is conceived as an entire arch that would go across the entirety of the church and finish on the other side. Uh, so it's not just propping up one side of the church, it is enveloping the whole of the church. And they did find later that they could do it more simply with less stone. Uh, but when uh, the architect Violet Le Duc in the middle of the 19th century was restoring Notre Dame, um, he found Found that even bits and pieces that we would consider purely decorative, like this little house doodad on top of this enormous pier, they actually have a function. Um, they, they, even though they're small, they keep the plumb line of the weight just exactly where it needed to be. Uh, and in the 18th century, when there was a tremendous backlash against medieval architecture, a lot of these uh, gargoyles and decorative elements were taken down um, because they were in poor repair. But instead of being repaired uh, because they offended the neoclassical taste of the time, they were simply removed. Uh, and it was found that that in in cases had an impact on the physical health of the building. Uh, so even decorative elements are part of the, um, the structure. 
Uh, now we'll look at the vaulting of the nave. So of course, in this slide, we're not seeing those enormous columns at the bottom, but we are seeing the, uh, the ribs that spring from each column, three main ribs that spring from each capital, each column, the center one going directly across, you know, up that pointed vault, um, which is hard to see in this slide, looking straight up, and then directly across to the other side, so forming an entire arch. Um, but the one on the left going diagonally, crossing the next center one, uh, and finishing down here to create these sexpartite vaults. Very beautiful, but also very light and very strong uh, and very logical. This you know, this central member is always going to go straight across. It's never going to go wander over here or over there. Um, and it all has this marvelous internal, internal logic. It's been likened to scholastic philosophy with its A's and its A1s, A2s, um, you know, its, its points and lists, its logic. And then above the vaulting, between the stone ceiling and the lead roof, we find the so-called forest. When people ask, how can a stone church burn? This is the answer. Um, that um, this uh, area of wood held up the roof. Um, and was nearly a thousand year old oak. Um, and we know now that a lot of what was previously thought about these, these superstructures, these frameworks in Gothic cathedrals was wrong. We used to think that these were um, mighty 200 year old oaks. Um, that the beams were all a hundred feet long and you know, sawn from these enormous trees. Not at all. We now know uh, that there were about a thousand oak trees felled to make this, um, this wood structure of the roof. And that it was from a managed forest that all of these oak trees were about 60 years old, and they would have all been planted at the same time, quite close together, so that they didn't have a lot of room to spread out, and they just grew straight up. And most of the trees um, that were used were only, you know, 15 inches, 12 inches in diameter, um, and about 15 feet long, not 100 feet long. There are some longer, up to 50 feet um, from larger, older trees. Uh, but for the most part, um, they are trees of about this size. And they were not sawn, but rather hewn with axes. And they were not aged for decades until they were absolutely dry, but rather they were used green. And that allowed them to sort of settle with the building. There's a similar uh, process that goes on with the centering of those um, nave arches. Um, each of these had a wooden structure when it was erected that kept the masonry in place when it when when the mortar was still wet. And you had to remove your centering at exactly the right time. If you went you know, if you took it away too early, the still wet mortal would crumble. But if you waited too long and it was too dry, it wouldn't have the flexibility that it needed. And the same thing is achieved by using um, green wood, wood that has just been cut. Uh, so fortunately, there are projects going on training um, carpenters, carpenters without borders, um, in these medieval techniques, because now they are needed. So we come to the outside of the church. Um, and what I want to impress on you most is that most of what we see is 19th century, uh, because of the devastations of the French Revolution. Uh, 
and we look here at the facade and we see that even though there are five aisles inside the, the center uh, nave and the two side aisles, there are only three doorways because three is that very significant number within Christianity. Um, and there is a use here of what we call sacred geometry. The square represented the mortal realm uh, with our four cardinal directions, with our four elements. Um, uh, and the circle represented paradise the divine realm. Um, and when you um, place a circle inside a square, particularly when you have a statue of the virgin holding the baby Jesus, whose head comes almost right up to the center of that circle, that is symbolic of um, the birth of Jesus, of the interpenetration of the holy, the divine, on our plane, in our world. And there are a number of those symbolic aspects to the architecture. So we have the portal level, and then we have the layer of the kings of Judah, the kings that are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, then we have the layer of the rose window. Um, and then this marvelous filigree layer, and then the uh, famous towers, which we think were originally meant to be topped with spires. Those were never built, but there was a spire built over the crossing where the, um, uh, the nave and the transept meet. Um, this is the oldest of the three doors. Uh, so I'll be looking at these uh, doors, starting from this one, uh, which is known as the portal of St. Anne um, or of St. Marcel, who is the saint on this upright in the middle, which is called the Trumeau. And this is a re restoration. The original um, sculpture is in the Musée de Cluny, um, but it's very, very damaged and decapitated. Uh, but the interesting thing, so um, the interesting thing about this portal is that the sculptural style is um, from some years earlier. So um, we think that this either was, um, so, so we, we think, we know that the church was begun in 1160 or that those, you know, the, the was probably, digging was probably begun earlier, but that foundation stone was laid in, in 1160. This is earlier stylistically. So either they were already carving um, the portals for this church, or this was intended for the earlier church on this site, and then just kind of kept in reserve to place into this portal, which has a more pointed aspect. So these uh, angels up here were added. Um, it shows St. Anne, the mother of the um, the Virgin uh, and the story, well, um, the stories uh, in these two layers are the stories of the life of the Virgin and her parents. Um, but that culminates with this image of Virgin and Christ child, very frontal, uh, very late Romanesque, not yet in the Gothic style. Um, and we think uh, that this is, um, you know, Louis the seventh and uh, the, um, the, the clergyman who built this structure. So uh, you can see this kind of very formal style, uh, very symmetrical in the way that the uh, drapery is handled, late Romanesque, not matching the date of the building. So by the time they got to the facade, uh, it was the 13th century. Um, so the rest of the carvings date to about 1210 or 1220. In other words, 70 years after uh, these, these earlier carvings. And they are fully Gothic. 
Um, so this is the portal of the Virgin. Of course, the entire church is devoted to the Virgin. She appears time and time again, but it is Virgin and Child who stand on the trumeau um, and um, the death of the Virgin and her coronation in heaven are the stories told in this um, one. But I wanted to show you this 1855 photograph of this same portal. You'll notice there are no jam sculptures whatsoever. Um, this part survived quite well, um, but there are no jam sculptures. And this figure is not that one. She is standing much more frontally. Um, this figure is swaying and looking at the baby Jesus, she is in fact this virgin and child from another unrelated church on the Ile de la Cité um, that had been brought uh, to this Trumeau um, uh, in the early 19th century because it looked bare. Uh, and um, Violet le Duc, uh, brought her inside and attached her to an interior pillar. Uh, and she's known now as the Virgin of the Pillar or Our Lady of Paris. She has become a symbol of Notre Dame and she has absolutely nothing to do with the original building. She is beautiful. She's a gorgeous um, high Gothic virgin and child, uh, but she is not um, original. Uh, so up here, we can see the portal of the Virgin, um, uh, these, um, these more original carvings um, uh, of the early 13th century that survived fairly well, although as we'll see, constantly being um, upgraded. Uh, and this is one of the prophets. So this guy is one of these figures from the archivolt, which is what we call these um, um, rows of, um, of arches. Um, and so looking at this, I think it's, we, can, we can see pretty clearly that that hand is not original. You can see how much cleaner it looks than that hand. Uh, the middle of the scroll didn't survive these centuries. That has been replaced with much smoother limestone. Uh, but the head, resting on that hand, um, pitted, um, worn uh, by the centuries, that is original 13th century work. Um, and this is original 19th century work. Uh, so uh, when Violet le Duc was restoring the cathedral in the 1850s, uh, his team of sculptors created all of the jam sculptures. They were all destroyed during the French Revolution. Uh, so this one is Emperor Constantine. And if you're ever looking at the facade of a French cathedral, wondering who any of these people are, and you happen to see a figure standing between two angels with his head in his hands, you know for sure that that is Saint Denis, the legendary first Bishop of Paris, who was decapitated on Montmartre, um, Martyr's Hill, uh, and then picked up his head, uh, and with two angels to accompany him, he walked his head to where the Abbey Church of Saint Denis is now cited, set it down, and said, this is where I want my monument built. Uh, a legend, of course, uh, but that headless figure is Saint Denis. Uh, and here is the center portal, and this one was uh, the most damaged even prior to the revolution, because Louis XV wanted to have big festivals and to carry um, you know, processions and floats and banners in and out the front door of Notre Dame. The front door was not big enough. So um, Louis XV's architect removed the trumeau, removed this upright, and removed this part of um, the archway. 
uh, Viollet le Duc put them back, uh, but they are completely refabricated in the 19th century. Um, and this one is devoted to the last judgment, as was very common on a cathedral. So we see the, uh, the dead awakening, uh, Jesus in glory, and um, on the left, the saved, on the right, these sinners, but this is really mostly 19th century. Um, and if we compare it to the magnificent Romanesque tympanum of Santa Foy in Conk, um, we can see that here we have the very same uh, basic structure, um, heaven, hell, um, Jesus in judgment in the center, but it's much livelier. These devils are whacking sinners on the butt, sending them through this hellhole uh, demon thing um, to where they will be tortured. Whereas on the facade of last, the last judgment, um, the sinners look like preschoolers um, holding on to the rope out on an outing. Uh, the, the devils are none too scary. And this is, again, mostly modern work. Uh, but this, I think, is, is less likely to instill the kind of terror that's going to get you to behave well than the roastings and spearings and um, strangulation and all of the mayhem of the Romanesque uh, hell. Um, so that's the facade. I'm not going to look at the transept doors, but I did want to look at this one door, the red door, Port Rouge, on the north side of Notre Dame. Um, particularly, um, I wanted you to show you this photograph from 2009. Uh, so you can see that the Port Rouge is damaged. Uh, that these carvings have been lost that came down uh, these archivolts, uh, that these groups are largely intact, but this one is completely gone. Well, look at the Port Rouge again after its restoration. If you visited in 2012, this was what you saw. So the carvings of the flowers and the vines have been replaced. And this has been reconstituted by a 21st century sculptor. The point being that Notre Dame has always been continually in a state of being repaired and restored and renewed. Uh, and this is one of the original um, details with just the gorgeous carving of those roses, uh, the sensitivity of the figures, just absolutely beautiful. Um, the rose window we see here uh, from a different angle where the, um, the virgin's head seems to be right in the center. And um, this is very difficult now to see from the inside because of the 18th century organ uh, that it obscures the interior view of it. Uh, but this is that place where the, the circle is inscribed within the square. Um, we do know, finally, um, the names of the architects who worked on the transept windows. And originally they were about this size, uh, but these later architects were not content with them and tore out the original rose windows and remade them. Uh, so this one was uh, Jean de Chelle, uh, the North transept, and it is the best surviving of the rose windows. It has the most original medieval stained glass. Uh, so you can see here that the laciness of the stonework um, and the um, the effect of that from the inside of the building that is just magical. You can also, I think, tell that this lower register of glass is not medieval. The colors are not as rich. Uh, it's 19th century glass. This is all medieval. Um, unfortunately, oh, and just 
give you some details of the delicacy of the stonework. Um, you can see that this is a, a virgin and child, that the entire window is dedicated to the virgin, that she is surrounded by uh, the prophets and the, uh, the wise men and women uh, of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament. But absolutely stunning. Uh, the south transept, uh, designed by Pierre de Montreuil, beginning in 1258, did not survive as well. Already in the 18th century, it was in a poor state of repair and, and uh, needing to be shored up. Uh, and essentially, Violet le Duc had to completely take it apart and refashion it. Um, and even though he is working in the 19th century, um, he doesn't trust himself to use as delicate a filigree of stone as the original artists of the medieval period. So it's heavier now than the North transept, uh, and less of the original stained glass survives. Now, there was originally sculpture in the building. Uh, this was an Adam, and there was also a lost Eve uh, that stood in the south transept. Uh, and just compare him, this beautiful nude. We don't think of this being a medieval subject. And yet here is Adam um, with this beautiful sway to his body. Compare him to one of the... Um, Adams created in the 1860s by Violet Le Duc's team. Uh, and you can see just the, the superior quality of the medieval workmanship, the three dimensionality of the fig leaves, um, the naturalness of the pose. There is no comparison. Um, inside um, the uh, deck. the decorations were constantly redone and renewed. Uh, this um, brilliantly painted choir screen is from the early 14th century and gives us some idea of what the colors of the entire cathedral might have looked like because the facade and the interior would all have been brilliantly painted and gilded as we see in the uh, this choir screen. Uh, this is these are scenes from uh, the story of the birth of Jesus, uh, Mary lying in the manger, the, uh, the three kings. Um, Marie Therese, the wife of uh, Louis XIV, um, felt so strongly about her role as patroness of Notre Dame uh, that she commissioned this portrait of herself holding that tiny little model of the cathedral. Uh, and indeed, um, her husband redid the pavement, creating these you know, very baroque, um, enormous marble, um, decorative schemes of the pavement. Uh, and Louis XIV also uh, redid the high altar um, with these very Baroque sculptures of the Pieta, um, you know, the, uh, the Virgin mourning the dead Jesus, um, and sculptures of Louis XIII, Louis XIV's father, who had made a vow that he was going to um, uh, restore the high altar, really obliterate the original high altar and replace it. Uh, he'd made that vow um, when he had finally a male, uh, healthy male child, uh, but it was his son that would eventually carry it out. Um, now, the 18th century, as I've mentioned, in uh, was, was not fond of Gothic architecture. Uh, and so they took down some of the gargoyles and they commissioned these rectangular paintings that they, they then erected over the pointed arches of the cathedral to hide those Gothic arches that are not the nice Roman type round arches. Um, 
that was what the Ancien Regime uh, did to Notre Dame. Of course, the revolution did much worse, uh, destroying all of the jam sculptures, looking at that row of sculptures of the kings of Judah and imagining them to be their hated monarchy, the kings of France. So they knocked down and destroyed all of those sculptures. But some either lover of medieval art or royalist saved 21 of the 28 heads of the kings of Paris by hiding them in his wine cellar. And he hid them so well that they were not relocated again until 1977. Uh, when these 21 heads were found and immediately obviously identified as the lost heads of the kings of Judah. Uh, they are now in the Musée de Cluny, and although very damaged, uh, we get a sense of the spectacular workmanship, even though these were so high on the facade that nobody would have ever had this kind of face-to-face -face look at them. Uh, they still have this extraordinary uh, craft. Uh, the, uh, the revolution turned Notre Dame into a temple of reason, uh, and then Napoleon turned Notre Dame into his coronation site. Uh, so you can see him here um, crowning Josephine on the steps of that high altar. You can see a bit of the Pieta there. What you don't see um, in the work of this great neoclassical artist, Jacques-Louis David, you don't see a single pointed arch. He has um, chopped off those arches at the top of his painting to make them look that much more neoclassical. But the thing that really led to the restoration of this building was a book, a book written by a 29-year-old author a book that we translate as The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but whose original title is simply Notre Dame de Paris, because for Victor Hugo, the building itself is his protagonist. And he wrote long passages of description lamenting the changes between the time that he'd set his novel, the, um, the Notre Dame that Quasimodo would have known, and the Notre Dame of 1831. And this led the people of Paris to want to restore the building. The book was a remarkable success. And so the French state uh, decided they held a contest for restoration of the building which was won by Eugène Violet le Duc and his partner who died during the course of the restoration. So between 1845 and 1865, Violet le Duc and his team of engineers and scaffold builders and stonemasons and so forth completely refurbished this building, which you'll notice in 1847 had no transept spire. It was hated. It was uh, seen as too gothic in the 18th century, and it was replaced by something they called the pepper pot uh, that wasn't structurally sound, so it was just eliminated. Uh, so this is a photograph of some of, the, some of the scaffolding, some of the restoration, a photograph of the new carvings. This is the virgin that would go up in front of the rose window. So all of this new work was being done. Here she is, uh, and the row of the brand new kings, uh, the gallery of kings below it. Um, so essentially, most of the facade fabric of Notre Dame is the work of 19th century sculptors, and it is Violet Le Duc who designed this very medieval looking Spire, um, this model uh, for which was carried out by Auguste Bellieu um, with its um, you know, very gothic <laughs> proportions. Um, however, this too needed work. You can see that there are these 
uh, copper statues that led up to the spire, and they were in a state of disrepair. So, uh, oh, even even the famous gargoyles are mostly 19th century. You know, so this was done around 1850. Um, and what we think of Notre Dame and what we think of Gothic, a lot of it is neo-Gothic and essentially Victorian. Um, so those copper statues needed to be restored. Uh, and so, and as did the spire. And so in 2019, scaffolding was erected all, all around the spire. Those statues were all removed from the building um, on April 11th, 2019. And four days later, the building caught fire. And we don't know exactly what sparked it. It's thought an electrical short from um, like a, a saw or some, some of the equipment of the workers, but it burned the spire. The spire went, um, it was completely consumed in flames um, and collapsed through the vaults of the building. It was an absolute tragedy for this beloved structure. But there were some positives. So let me start with the positives. No one was killed. And in a building this visited, that was almost a miracle. No one was killed. Um, the great rose windows that you could see videos of the night of the fire with flame shooting through them somehow survived. The organ survived. And many, most of the vaults survived. The building did not crumble. There was fear that if one of the towers were to collapse, it would bring the entire structure down. Uh, but instead, the building still stands. Um, it is a construction site now, but the building still stands. Now, Emmanuel Macron immediately announced that it would be restored, and it would be restored in five years, in time, you know, it would reopen in time for the 2024 Paris Olympics. Of course, COVID intervened, making that uh, already ambitious deadline even more so. Uh, but um, he uh, asked for proposals for the roof because originally Macron thought that they would replace the roof in a modern way. So this D Dutch architect thought, well, instead of a roof, how about a public swimming pool? And he arrayed those copper statues around the edges, almost like lifeguards. Uh, another architect replaced the roof in the traditional way, but designed a very modernistic spire that he called, perhaps inappropriately, the flame. And yet another, actually a few different architects proposed a green roof, a roof that would be a garden, a park, a living space. Uh, this one would grow food for the homeless population of Paris under a kind of a glass conservatory of a roof. Um, and once conservatives got wind of these designs, uh, the, they, they shut it down entirely. Uh, and the government and eventually Macron agreed that the, uh, the building would be repaired to look exactly as it did in 2019. Uh, and all of that melted scaffolding has been removed and the building has been stabilized. So there's not much that has visibly happened between 2019 and 2022. Um, but there was a tremendous amount of evaluation and stabilization of the remains. Um, 
you, and you can see the, this is some of the, the melted scaffolding. Um, and I believe that new scaffolding is now up on the building. Uh, Macron continues to insist that it will be usable by 2024. I suspect he's going to do the medieval thing and start with the altar uh, and build from there. Um, most experts think it is absolutely impossible to have the building finished now in two years. But people all over the world have opened their pocketbooks to contribute to the rebuilding in the hope that uh, Notre Dame will um, one day, hopefully sooner rather than later, recover her original glory. Thank you. So I apologize, I've gone 15 minutes long, um, but there's so much, um, so much to talk about with this building. Um, if you have been patient enough to be with me all this time, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Um, you'll have to unmute yourselves um, or write them into the chat. Rebecca, that was amazing. I don't have a question. I'm just stunned. I learned so much. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, other, other questions? Um, you are all muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Has anyone been to Paris recently and seen Notre Dame? Maggie, uh, what was your impression? So you're muted. Um. Well, one of the things that impressed me was that well, they have sort of living quarters for the workers. It's like a building in itself alongside the, the cathedral. But I was, I think we were there at a time, it was right before Easter maybe or something. It wasn't being, uh, the, I, it didn't look like any activity was happening right then. Yeah, one, one expert commented that it would take 10 years simply to train the necessary stonemasons um, to re-carve those, those vaults that did collapse um, because that, those are skills that just don't exist um, in or at least not in the numbers that are needed um, in the 21st century. Uh, and I think it's fantastic that they have those carpenters without borders doing their medieval techniques, um, keeping some of those skills alive. Um, so they, they will be called upon when it's time to rebuild the wood structure, the forest. Rebecca? Um, Yes. Where, where is the town uh, where the Carpenters Without Borders exists? I do not know. Well, well they are. They, they, they exist all over, apparently. But, the, but, there, but it's, uh, there's a I, it's somewhere in France, but there's a specific historical site, kind of like yes. a, a Williamsburg. Uh, yes. But I don't know exactly where it is. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, Sarah? Yes, uh, I have visited Notre Dame several times. The first time in 1957, when I was had just graduated from high school and was on my way to spend the summer at the Université de Dijon. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and most recently, in February of 2020, when my son Ted and I went to Paris for a day on our way back from our uh, visit to tonon les bains with the Mercer Island Sister City Association. So we saw they, they had surrounded it with uh, uh, obviously fencing to keep everybody out. And they also put all kinds of stuff on the fence about the history and the, and the plans for what they were going to do. So it has been it was fascinating, and I know I was have been there at other times a little less memorable, but one of them was shepherding my grandson when he was 10, and we uh, had some time in Paris, so that would have been in 2008, 
So it's a fantastic place that I never paid enough attention to until yeah. bad things happened to it. Yeah. Um, Rebecca? Yes. I made a note of an article that was in the paper about a week ago. I think it was in The Guardian. And that site where they're supposed to be building is a castle in northern Burgundy. Oh, wow. Thank you. Guedelon, Guedelon, G U E G E L O N. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one thing that I, I forgot to mention, uh, but they, they recently unveiled plans for the, the piazza, the, the, the place. Um, they're going to do a lot more green space, more trees to make it a more climate friendly space. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that I read in the New York Times just recently. Uh, Ted? Yeah, I remember uh, studying uh, Notre Dame uh, briefly uh, in architecture school um, and also studying uh, other uh, cathedrals uh, in uh, Europe uh, and learning how it takes decades uh, to build a cathedral. And sometimes they'll just stop construction on a cathedral and wait uh, 10, 15 years for what they've built so far to settle before they start building more. Um, and I remember one of the cathedrals, I don't think it was Notre Dame, but that uh, showed how the pews um, changed in design from the front to the back of the church, not because someone had, th had said, hey, let's have different pews, but rather there's a different generation of sculptors by the time they got to the back of the church and they wanted to have their mm -hmm. own mark uh, on it. Yeah. So they changed the design uh, in order yeah. to uh, match what was then in vogue, I guess, uh, a, a decades later. Um, I, I wonder whether in um, uh, the... I guess as you were talking about, like the the spire was added uh, by Villa le Duc, and that was uh, essentially the the nineteenth century uh, or one of the nineteenth century uh, changes or imprints uh, on the church. Uh, but were there uh, other markings of uh, uh, subtle changes that were made uh, during the original construction from uh, the eleven hundreds to twelve hundreds to absolutely. show absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to see if I can um, just reshare the screen and then um, go back to, huh? Uh, let's see. Um, it's going to. It's it's a long way. Well, maybe uh, it's a long way back. I'm trying to see if there's somewhere else we can see it. Uh, but um, looking at the interior. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, sorry if I'm making anyone dizzy, okay. um, but um, one of the best examples is um, in the uh, Triforium level. Mm -hmm. See it here? Yeah. Um, so on this side, there is a, a roundel in the top of the arch of the Triforium. Mm -hmm. On this side, there is not. Mm. And it was just a different master builder who decided, hey, let's let a little more light through. Let's, let's pierce this top as well. Uh, so these were earlier and these were later. So yes, there are many, many of those. The, the columns, as they get towards the back of the church, change and evolve. Mm. Um, um, I think I'm not sure I have a slide of the back of the church, but they, um, um, I think in the back, there are even some that are more like the piers of later mm -hmm. Gothic, mm -hmm. uh, where those, those ribs go all the way to the ground. And instead of mm -hmm. a big column, you have this complex um, pier structure with all of these attaching ribs that go up and that go uh, that go over to uh, over that arch and over this arch and so forth, um, and that as you get farther back in the church, that they look more like um, you know a, a high Gothic building. Mm -hmm. uh, but but this part of Notre Dame went up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the the fact that they you know they they said the first mass in 1260 and then said the first mass in the building or sorry 1160 and then 1282 they had a you know at least an altar to say mass mm -hmm. on that's 
very, very rapid mm -hmm. uh, 22 years for the, the choir area. Um, there are other, like, like Chartres has mismatched towers mm -hmm. because when they put up the second one, they wanted to put it up in the prevailing style of that time. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they didn't care about symmetry. They cared about what they felt was the most beautiful single tower they could build. Um, I remember the, uh, walking through the Sagrada Familia in uh, um, Barcelona um, uh, back in 93. I haven't been back to it since then, uh, but it, the, the, the cathedral's not done yet. Um, it's going to you know, take decades to finish it, but you can still walk through it. It's still, you know, it, it, it can, even though it's a, uh, part of it's a construction site, um, it, it's kind of like what uh, I, I think it's kind of like what uh, uh, Notre Dame probably felt like um, in the uh, early 1200s when yeah. part of it's still under, under construction, but part of it's a working church. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. This is a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I'll unshare again. Well, thank you all so much for coming and supporting the Mercer Island Sister City Association. Jane, did you have final remarks? Uh, no, just thank you very much. And um, please check out the chat <laughs> and uh, come to the presentation uh, November uh, 16th. You'll get notification um, in your email about that. Yeah. <clears throat> and if, you know, if the creek don't rise, we will be there in person. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> we'll do a romp through art history at the Louvre. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Take you very much. Thank you all. Take care. See you in November. Thank you, Jane, too. Uh, hey, tout thank you, Jane. Merci bien. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs>